Okay, Miko. Well, thank you very much for coming here. Thank it was you. a pleasure to have you here, and we're really grateful that you made some space thank in you. your schedule. Uh, could you please uh, quickly introduce yourself to our viewers? Sure. So, my name is Mikko Hyppinen. I am the Chief Research Officer for F-Secure Corporation, <coughs> and I worked at F-Secure in research and re reverse in engineering positions for, oh my god, 27 years now. Wow. Maybe you should stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long time, but it, it's really been a wild ride. Uh -huh. I've seen not only this company change from mm -hmm. a small startup to a you know big company operating mm -hmm. around the world, but also the whole industry grow from nothing to where mm -hmm. it is today. But the biggest change must have been the change in the attackers, because that has changed more than anything else. And that's what I, I'd like to ask you about the attackers. It started, as you uh, just explained in your talk, as teenagers in a garage. So they were clearly hobbyists. Mm -hmm. Then they became professionals and the whole thing became a business. What's the next step for this market? It's hard to see exactly what's happening, but one fear we mm -hmm. have when we try to analyze the different actors and how it evolves is that we would see more serious attacks from extremists and terrorists. Because mm -hmm. we haven't seen cyber terrorism yet. We do know uh, and we have analyzed how extremist groups like Al-Qaeda or mm -hmm. Islamic State or other extremist groups, how they use the, use the internet. And they do use the internet for uh -huh. you know, collecting donations, for recruitment, for radicalization, for propaganda, for encrypted communications. But what they have been unable to do so far is to launch actual attacks. And that would have been possible as well, but uh, we, we hope we will never see that. But it is one possibility. So you think that groups such as Anonymous, for example, still don't qualify as uh, extremists? Movements like Anonymous is categorized as hacktivists mm -hmm. in our book, hacktivists or hacker activists. And they are unique based on their motivation because they're not doing it um, for money. They're uh -huh. not doing it because they would be a governmental agency or spies mm -hmm. or, or military. They're doing it to protest. This is basically okay. the online version of going outside the headquarters of a company that's, that's doing something unethical or something that you don't like, mm -hmm. and you're outside of their headquarters throwing rocks at their windows to protest against the company. Today, people do it online. They deface websites, they launch denial of service attacks. But the important thing to notice here is that they don't get anything for themselves. They're not mm -hmm. making money, they're not stealing. They are showing their opinions. Okay, and um, by the way, feel free not to answer this question sure. if you don't like to. But in your opinion, what's the biggest threat to our online personas? The public or the private sector in cybercrime? We have different kinds of threats. Um, the actual security threats, cyber security threats, mm -hmm. come mostly, I mean, the most likely thing to hit you is coming from a cyber criminal. Someone mm -hmm. trying to steal your credit card number to gain access to your your bank account, things like that. That's the most likely thing to hit you. Um, but then we have a completely different problem, which is mm -hmm. the privacy problem. Yeah. Security and privacy. And mm -hmm. the biggest threat to your privacy is Google, or yeah. Facebook, or LinkedIn, or mm -hmm. Twitter, or any of these free services. There's no mm -hmm. free lunch. There's no free lunch on the internet either. All these free services monetize themselves by collecting information about you. Now, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I love Google. I love Google yeah. products. They're great products. I'd love to use them and I'd love to pay for them. But for most of the Google but you products... you don't even have that option. Exactly. For most of these products, you can't even pay. Even if you want, like Google search, you can't mm. pay for it. The only way you can pay is with your privacy. And that sucks. Absolutely. Absolutely. So another thing that has changed, in, in my opinion, is that until recently, uh, cyber attacks were kind of mimicking what is done in the real world. Uh, they attack places that have money, that store money. Sure. So, but now, as you said, money has become data. Maybe we can start seeing attacks that are aimed at money itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe at Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other uh, cyber um, crypto coins. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's going to become a 
substantial risk, something that we'll have to protect ourselves? Or? It is a real clear trend. This is already happening and it is very obviously happening and for a very good reason. Like when you look at these attacks from the point of view, point of, view of the attacker, these attacks make a lot of sense. Like if you're yeah. trying to make money, yes, you can make money by hacking a bank. You can make money by hacking an online store and stealing payment information. You can make money by running a keylogger to get PayPal logins, but that's traditional money. You mm -hmm. still have to launder it. You still have yeah. to somehow move it to the real world. And that's the hard part. That's the choke part on, on, on cyber criminals. That's why the same criminals and the same groups which used to target real world mm -hmm. banks or their online bank equivalents yeah. are now moving attacks against cryptocurrency exchanges or the groups that used to do attacks against uh, online stores are now targeting cryptocurrency wallets or fishers which used to be stealing PayPal credentials are now launching attacks to gain access to people's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin wallets. Once they gain access to these currencies, these new data mm -hmm. currencies, then it's game over. Then it's game over. They, they, the money is already anonymized. It's already untrackable. They can take it and do whatever they want with it, and we can't find them. Okay. And um, in your opinion, what are the, the most common mistakes that common users do that put in risk their online assets, privacy, etc.? Is mm. there there's some uh, common blunders that we all make and should, could and should avoid? Well, yes. Um, two good examples. First one, backups. Ransom Trojans like WannaCry and Petya and all the others, they wouldn't be a problem at all if you would just have backups. Like if you get hit by a Ransom Trojan which has encrypted your you know, personal files, you just restore yesterday's backups and you carry on. You don't have to pay a thing. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing at your company. Why would you ever no. pay anything? But then when we look at the reality, we see that this is not what's happening. People don't have backups of their data. Companies are unable to restore data to continue operations. They don't have all of it backed up. They have it too infrequently backed up or what mm -hmm. have you. So backups, that's one thing. Okay. The other thing, it's as simple as backups. It's passwords. Passwords continue to be a problem. And for a very good reason. I mean, we, we all need tens or hundreds of passwords for our, our account so it's, it's impossible to maintain a strong and unique password in every for a, service, for each service unless you use a password manager. So use a password manager. That's what I do. Okay. Makes sense. And uh, moving from users to developers, and that's something that really uh, exasperates me because we train developers at, at Keep Coding sure. Mobile, Web, Big Data, and it's very, very easy to get them interested in some new technology but it seems almost impossible to get them interested in uh, application security mm -hmm. and making their software secure. So how can we fix that? Because if the people that build software are not aware and not interested in making it safe, it's a losing battle. Um, I disagree. I think, I think it's not that hard to get developers and designers and, and technical people to get interested, even excited about mm -hmm. security. I know this when I look around the devs and, and researchers we have in our organization. Okay. I believe some of the best technical minds in the world choose to work in security. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're really good, you, you, you can work in any field you want. You could, you could be writing operating systems or office applications or search engines or, you know, games. Mm -hmm. But many of these best minds choose to work in security because when you work in security, what you're doing is that you're helping people. You're helping people. People come to you in their hour of need asking for help and you're able to help them. That's, that's important. That's important work. That work mm -hmm. matters. And you're also one of the good guys, you know, with the white hat against uh -huh. the evil who are trying to attack end users. So it's a very rewarding job and it feels like an important job. Um, what you're saying does ring, ring, ring bell as well. The fact that people who are not working in security themselves, um, they need to be able to, do, to follow secure coding practices to prevent security vulnerabilities from mm -hmm. their systems. Um, a good tip there, which, which um, especially web application developers should always take a look at, uh -huh. are, are, are things like the OVAS uh, top lists of the most typical 
blunders, the most typical mistakes people who don't work in security make when they develop security centric applications. So uh, if I understand what you're saying is that uh, we could test our software against uh, well-known attacks in the same systematic way that we test uh, against known or expected bugs with TDD. Similar Absolutely. techniques could be used. There's very much similarities into automated testing and uh, looking for, for uh, security vulnerabilities. Techniques like fuzzing work mm -hmm. for both. So it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. And uh, it's also good to note that when you're building um, large-scale products where you have large amounts of customers, it's always a good idea to order a pen test mm -hmm. against your ready product. That's the way you'll find out the kind of holes real attackers would find from your yeah. system, and then you get to fix them before they happen for real. Okay, and... Oh, and bug yes. bounties. Bug Sorry? bounties. That's oh, a great idea. Of course. Bug yeah. bounties. Do it. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, you also mentioned that the IoT revolution is here, like it or not, and that brings a, a new set of, uh, of assets. You even have a, a law about this. Oh, yes, the, yes. Can yes. you explain what's the Iponing law? Yeah, some, somewhere once said that um, whenever something is described to you as smart, uh -huh. what you should be hearing is vulnerable. Vul <laughs> and okay. someone then tagged it as a Hyppanen law, so yeah, it's a law named after me. So anyway, you know, here's a smart watch, mm -hmm. a vulnerable watch. Smart phone, that's a vulnerable phone. Yeah. Smart building, smart city, smart mm -hmm. car. All of these become vulnerable as we add functionality and connectivity. Things that were unhackable before mm -hmm. because hackers couldn't reach them yeah. are at least in theory hackable when they are connected to the online networks. Mm -hmm. And what about these new uh, smart speakers such as uh, Amazon Echo, mm -hmm. HomePods, etc. Uh, according to this law, they are vulnerable, sure. but there's, they're not just allow, uh, smart speakers, they're also smart listeners. Mm -hmm. And that's what worries me the most. You have a device listening, potentially listening to everything that you're saying in your house. So don't you think that puts them in a completely new category? It's a different ballgame. Well, it's a really a new level of trust that end users are, are giving to these companies. And I think out of the vendors working in this space, I believe personally that Apple mm -hmm. is, the, is best positioned. Uh, Apple's HomePod is probably not the best product mm -hmm. uh, function-wise when you compare yeah. it to the competition. Um, but Apple is such a privacy-centric company now because they are not, their business model is not to collect your information exactly. and sell it like Google. Their business model, model is to sell you overpriced stuff. Exactly. That's their yeah. business model. And if, if that's the business model, they don't need to break your privacy, and yeah. they are doubling down with that, and that's why, if I would have to recommend a smart speaker to someone, I would recommend an Apple HomePod. Okay. Espera só um segundo que está tentando. Okay. A friend of mine who lives in the U.S. He also works in security and um, policy, mm -hmm. establishing policies. He keeps his, his uh, Amazon Echo in the bo uh, in the bathroom, so that it will only listen when he wants and he opens the door. Ah. Do you think that's paranoia or it's caution? Uh, that's caution. Mm. And that's coming from someone who's as paranoid as <laughs> hell. I mean, I, I'm really paranoid about my own security and privacy. So yeah, that's what I would do as well. I, I, I recommend that. But I do also see how that's not maybe what all people want to do. And, and people want to, want to use technology in their lives because it makes their lives easier. And, and that's what technology should be doing. And that's also what security should mm -hmm. be doing. I'm actually really fed up with the bad reputation we security mm -hmm. people have because we have the reputation that we always say no. Yes, that whatever absolutely. you ask from security, they're going to say no. no. Like, can I do this? No. no. Can I buy this device? No. Can I open up this port and a fire, firewall? No. no. So I've decided that I am no longer saying no. From now on, mm -hmm. I'm saying yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can use that device. Yes, we can open up that port. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can do that. But there's but, always a but. but. There's always a but. Yeah. Um, but what I'm trying to, 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 to say here is mm -hmm. that security should be the enabler. Security should be the part of our technology which enables us to do what we want to do. It should be the enabler, not the thing that stops us from doing uh -huh. what we want to do. Okay, very interesting. Miko, thank you very much again for your time. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for here. your work and thank you for such a great event. And I hope to see you back here in Madrid pretty soon. Next time. Excellent. All the best. Thank you very much.